The survival mode in Illusion is only one mode that the game will offer, however, it's probably the best mode in order to train and understand the game in order to be better and be competitive on the other modes. I am Froby, I'm a former pro player at Teamfight Tactics, and I'm here to teach you everything I know about the auto battler so you guys and I can become together the 21st century tacticians. Let's start right away. In the survival mode, your aim is going to face many waves of illusions in front of you and to survive as many waves as possible with the deck you are offered. Right now it's a private beta so the deck here is randomized and you'll have a new deck every day. But later, during the open beta and after, you will have to play your own deck of illusions that you have captured in the overworld. During the survival mode, each wave you have to face stronger and stronger waves. Right now is the wave number one, so we just have one Illuvior in front of us. And we also have to manage our resources correctly. So you can see here that in the survival mode, we will be able to place only eight Illuvios, and we can also change two Illuvios per round. And finally, we have the mastery point. This is the resources. You can call that the gold if you want, because every time we want to play one Illuvior, we will have to pay this amount of mastery point and every round we get 25 more mastery point. So you have to plan ahead and you have to make sure that first you play with units that you can buy and play and then after later you can try to decide to play stronger units but more expensive ones. Each Illuvio have four attributes. Let's say for instance I play this Axon here. So as you can see, I have to pay 40 mastery points. Now I have only 85 left. Axon is an illusion like many others, and he has different attributes. He has synergies like water and harbinger. I'm going to explain a bit more about synergies later. He has some core stats, health, energy, and some attack damage, etc. I'm not going too far about that. Just know that so these stats are going to change based on the illusion. It has also an omega ability. This Omega ability for Axon, for instance, is something that creates a shield around his head. And while there's a shield, he becomes tankier, more difficult to kill, but also he will deal some damage. And every Elivial has its own Omega ability. If you actually want to know everything about the Elivials, I have made already a video and you can check this one after this video. So now let's talk about the synergies. You can already see that on the left and on the right, there are some synergies. So on the left, these are the synergies of your team, which is currently on the board. So not the team that is here. And on the right, it's obviously the synergies of the enemy team. So for synergies, there are a few things you need to understand. The primary synergies are the synergies that most stage one uh, illusion are sharing. As you can see, Tattoo Piece, Earth and Cyan, these are primary. Uh, Lura is Earth and Rogues, these are primary synergies as well. Arcos is a stage 2 illuvial, so he has one which is primary, like nature, and the second one which is a composite. I'm going to explain it a bit, but these are the composite synergies. And finally, if we go to the late game units, the ones are very expensive because they are stage 3 units, you can see that Rainfire is Inferno and Slayers, both are composite. So in order to use the bonuses from the primary synergies, like water, for instance, you need to have at least three water illuvial on the board. Here I have only two because the ranger is water thanks to her weapon. I will explain the weapons a bit later. And Axon is water as well. So if I want to benefit from the first bonus of water, which grants more energy to every illuvial that is water, then I need to add another water illuvial. For instance, Alfie. You saw the little animation, it means that I activated the water. For every primary synergy, the bonuses are activated only if you reach 3, 6 or 9 illuvials with the synergy. As for composite synergies, like Harbinger, which is a mix of Bulwark and Psyon, because if you remember correctly, Axon is a Harbinger. These are composite synergies. It means that Axon will count as one Bulwark, one Scion, and one Harbinger. 
they bring a lot of synergies here as you can understand and that's why the stage 3 illuvials are very expensive but also very powerful. What you need to understand is also the fact that stage 2 and stage 3 illuvials like Axon who benefit from Harbinger will not benefit from Bulwark or Scion directly even if I have them activated. For instance if I have Thrip Scion which is supposed to give 30% Omega power to Axon he will not get this bonus. Instead, he's going to get another bonus from Harbinger. If you look at the description, you can see that the composites always have an innate ability and then a bonus. The bonus is exactly like the primary synergies. You need to have two, three, or four illuvials sharing the Harbinger in order to be able to benefit from the bonuses. But for the innate abilities, these are bonuses you get from the number of Scion and Bulwark in the team. If you look at this, for instance, we can say that whenever a Harbinger is casting its Omega ability, so the spell I was talking about the shield earlier, they will gain Omega power, physical and energy resist. And we can see below that the Omega power is based on how many Psyon you have on the board. Right now, I have two Psyon, as you can see here. So it means that Axon, when he will cast his shield, his Omega power, is going to earn 5% times 2, because I have two Psyon, max energy as Omega power. So you can say 10%. If I had 10 Psyon on the team, he will get 50%. So that's how the primary synergies are actually helping the composite synergies, you have to understand that it's not exactly accumulating all the bonuses, but rather it goes indirectly. And finally, let's talk about the Ranger. In Illuvium, you will be able to collect and craft equipments that you can use for your Ranger. In order to use them, you have to press Shift plus right click, and you have this pop up which shows a lot of equipment. Right now, in this private beta, we have this offered to us, but again, when the game will go live, we will have to craft our own items or we can try to buy them from someone else. We have two types of equipment. We have the armor, which are here, and we have the weapons. For the armors, just try to think as pure stats. For instance, the base armor only gives 400 HP and 15 of armor and 15 of energy resistance. But if we look at the tier 5 hybrid, it grants 1350 HP, which is much more than the jumpsuit. And then after, we also have the same amount of armor and energy resistance. When you will play the equipments in your game, it will cost you mastery points here. But right now, this is private beta, it's not implemented yet. So you have to think that you cannot change your equipment as much as you want. And now let's talk about the weapons of the Ranger. So for the Ranger, you can equip different weapons and you have to choose one for one fight. The base one is a pistol, which is granting the water element to the Ranger, but also the fighter class to the Ranger. So that's why I have three water now and I have one fighter, thanks to this equipment. But I can have a sword, which is a water sword or a fire sword. We will have actually for each weapon, we are going to have every element and we can see also that the class depends on the types of weapon for instance like i said a pistol is fighter sword is fighter if it's a gauntlet we have scion here it's a fire scion here it's a nature scion then we can have a shield that gives bulwark which is a tank a synergy a tank class then we have also the daggers which grants rogue it's more like an assassin class and here we have with the element of earth and we also have a staff which is air here and empath so the staff is going to be more like empath build around support units each weapon has also a different omega ability for now i just equipped a staff and if i right click on the hunter and i put my mouse on the hunter i can see that the staff has an ability to shield everyone around the ranger and also the people who are shielded will gain more attack speed. But if I decide to actually have a shield like this, the ability changes and now 
from the AoE shield, I rather have a small AoE of damage when she slams the shields on the ground and it will stun every unit that she touches that way. So you really need to adapt your strategy based on the weapons you get in order to maximize her potential and use her as a good flexible illusion. Okay, so now I have talked about all the basics you need to understand for the survival mode, I'm going to teach you the concepts, the first concepts of team building to make sure that you are making a good team well-rounded so you can beat your enemies. So whenever you want to build a team of illusions, you have to consider this something similar to an MMORPG. You know, when you go into a dungeon, you always try to have one good tank or two of tanks then you need to have support or healers, and also you need damage dealers. Whenever you create your team, you have to think the same way. You need to have a good harmony between offense, defense, and support. This is an example of a good team. Right now, I have my defense, thanks to Scarabuck, which is a good bulwark. I have also Arcus, which is Aegis. Aegis is bulwark as empath. And you will see that Empath is also a good support class. And then you have the Ranger, which is Bulwark. And now if we look at the Offense, I do have a Tatopi, which is a Psyon. It deals a lot of energy damage. Consider that like magical damage. And then I have Vermi, which is also a good damage dealer while being Empath because it shields itself, so it has some utility. And then finally, I have Rake, which is a rogue. A rogue considered that like an assassin. The idea of the classes for the Illuvials will tell you their role in the fight. Like I said earlier, if you have Bulwark, these are the ones who are going to hold the line for you. They are going to be tough to kill. If we have Empath, these ones are usually the ones that gives a shield, that gives a heal. It depends on their ability. But the idea is they are here to support the team. And then you have Psyon. These ones are the Illuvials that deal a lot of energy damage, usually with their Omega ability. For instance, Datopi is going to deal a lot of damage when he's going to cast its Omega ability. As you can see here, we have the same with Alfie, for instance, which is going to deal a lot of damage with its Omega ability. Then we have Ripterus, which is another type of damage dealer. These ones usually rely on their auto attack. You know, auto attack means that whenever they attack normally, they will actually have enhanced damage. Something like Ripterus and Fieriox really like this kind of damage. And finally, we have the last class, which are something similar to assassins. They are called rogues. They are like assassins because whenever the fight starts, they will jump to the other side of the board and try to assassinate the small little units and make a huge snowball from there. So for instance, in this team, I'm going to show you exactly the harmony of my team. Try to check this rake, which is going to jump there immediately and try to look a bit at my team here, how it holds the line. So like I said, rake jump here and then I have Vermi using the tank for rake or dash, sorry. And then Tatopi dealing damage, you can see here with the missiles. And you will see that actually from this team, my damage dealers, Rake and Tatopi, are the ones which deal the most damage. It makes sense because they are the damage dealer. But if we look also at the damage tanked or received, we can see that Scarabuck was and my Ranger were the one which tanked the most damage. It's normal because these are my tanks. And now if we look at the heal and the shield, we can see that Arcos is the one that healed the most in my team, which is normal because it's a support. So always try to have a good balance between offense, defense, and support. And this is how you're going to make a well-rounded team in your games. So here are some tips I would like to give you about the survival mode. When you will start the game, you will always try to play with low-cost units, for instance, Axon, Tatopi, Vermi, these kind of units, and try to put as many as you can. 
you need to try to reach around 6 to 8 in order to have a sheer amount of number of illuvials and win through that. Once you manage to reach this amount of illuvials, here for instance I have 5, which is correct already, you can decide to upgrade your units little by little thanks to the 25 mastery point you earn every turn. So for instance, right now I have 25 mastery points because I just finished the round. What I can do is to sell the Vermi and to replace by its bigger brother Vermilia. And that way my board is naturally stronger than just before. There is also another mechanic which is called the Hyper. So this is something that happens only during the fights. You will try to focus on the yellow bar which is really close to the health bar and sometimes you will see that the yellow getting bigger and bigger and this is the hyper. So I will start the fight and we will try to see if that happens for my rogues which are Vermilia and Rake. So you see Rake is starting to generate a bit of hyper here and the idea is like whenever Rake has more and more hyper it will gain bonuses. This is going to change a bit and I'm going to explain a bit further after this fight. Look at this beautiful fight. So the Hyper, if I had to describe what it is in one sentence, I would say the affinities, fire, water, whatever, are the ones which are charging the Hyper. And the classes, fighter, scion, bulwark, whatever, are the ones which manifest the power of the Hyper. Right now it's the private beta, but later the hyper will work that way. It means that whenever an illuvial has affinities that counter illuvials around it, it will charge the hyper much faster. For instance, water has an advantage over earth and a smaller advantage over fire. Earth has a big advantage over fire, but a smaller advantage against nature and so on. This is like rock, paper, scissors. And when the hyper is fully charged at 100%, the illuvial are going to get bonuses. And the bonuses depend on the class. For instance, the rogues will deal massive critical damage. Cyan units like Tatopi are going to have much, much more energy after casting its Omega. It means that it will cast its Omega ability much faster for the next ones and so on. So this is something that we will have to take into account when we are going to play against someone else because this is something we can decide and counter their team just based on affinities and have a clear advantage. So with the basics I said earlier, you understand how to play the game. And now with the concepts of tier building, you are going to make a well-rounded team based on what you have from early game to late game and you will be able to transition it by changing your units every round thanks to the additional mastery point. But this is not all. This is just half of what you need to do in order to survive longer. Because the other part is all about executing all you have learned with your theory. I'm talking about positioning. Sun Tzu, the author of The Art of War, has said that great results can be achieved with small forces. And this is the essence of positioning. Your aim is to make sure that with your team, you're going to use the full potential of every single individual in order to win the battle, even against boards or teams which are stronger than you. In order to explain to you the concepts of positioning for beginners, I'm going to use this fight in order to make sure that you focus on the right things and you can optimize it as much as you want. The first thing that you want to do, it's kind of obvious, but it's not necessarily obvious at the same time. You want to make sure that your tanks are the ones who take the first targeting. So in case you didn't know, whenever you play an auto battle like this, the targeting is very simple to understand. Each illuvials are going to attack the closest target, no matter what, within their range, of course. And whenever, for instance, they kill one target, and they switch their focus, they will again look for the closest target possible. And if you understand that, then you can make sure that your tanks are always the ones which are close to the illuvials of the enemy team. So here, for instance, let's analyze a bit this board. We have a Fieriox, which is a range unit. You can see that by right-clicking and look at the range. 
60 hex of range. A hex is a small thing here. You have 60 of range. That's a long range. You have run fire, which is 6 of range. So you understand that he attacks from melee range. And then we have dual F, which is also a 60 of range. So we can see that actually what's going to happen is that these two ones are going to attack from far away and run fire is going to be close combat. But also what we have to remember is that the run fire is a rogue. If we look at Slayer, we have rogue plus fighter. So run fire is going to jump at the beginning of the fight and target actually the backline. So I have to be careful of that. And if I want to make sure that run fire attacks a tank, I have to position myself correctly. For instance, I can simply put the tank here in the back line in front of run fire and I can hope that run fire is going to attack my tank and it's not going to attack my tattoo P because I want my tattoo P to have the time to deal a lot of damage and basically stay unbothered. On the other hand, my aim is to make sure that I don't waste my time on tanks. Fortunately for me here there are no tanks so I can just position my rogues like this and I'm going to focus immediately dual F because remember rogue units always jump to the other side of the board and they always jump to the furthest possible so they're not going to jump here they are going to jump around dual F no matter what. And what I'm going to do as well in order to make sure that run fire is not going to be smarter than I think and attack my units here, I'm just going to put them far away. I don't need to take any unnecessary risk and by doing so, I make sure that this run fire will waste its time here and I will kill these two units quite fast. And this is what's going to happen with this wave. So let's look at this. I'm attacking dual F, run fire is stuck here. So even if he has a big AOE, he's not going to touch many units. And actually, I'm going to kill everyone even before Rimfire kills my tank. And this is how you win a fight just by positioning your tanks much better than the opponents. The second tip I want to share to you is Focus Fire. Focus Fire is all about taking down units one by one as fast as possible instead of attacking a bit everyone, spreading the damage and in the end killing no one. In auto battlers, what you really want to try is to snowball the fight and you can do that by creating a number advantage and for that you just need to make sure that all your units are targeting the same ones in order to kill them super fast. And this is the focus fire. For instance, in this team, I make sure that I have Theriox, Scoriox, Tatopi, Scarabok and Arcos. I want to make sure that they are going to target Axon to kill it super fast because Axon is one of the tank but if all my team is focusing only on Axon it's not going to stay alive long but for instance if I had a positioning where I put uh, someone in front of Singe which is another tank and some people in front of Axon yes I'm going to deal the same amount of damage but it will be spread among different tanks so the tanks are going to last longer. That is why I really want to make sure that I focus only Axon and I kill it fast. I'm still going to keep my Ranger here in order to bait this run fire. So this run fire will be stuck here, like I said earlier, instead of attacking my team. And you will see, I will destroy this Axon super, super fast. And I think it's not going... See, Axon didn't even cast its Omega ability. It didn't have the time to have the shield and become tankier. And this is how I create a number advantage just by making sure that my whole team is attacking the same targets. This is focus fire. The third tip, which is somehow similar to the first and second, but in another dimension. I'm talking about finding a direction where you want to bridge the wall of the tanks in front of you. So for instance, in this example, there is a big tank here. And honestly, I don't really want to waste all my time on it, if I can, because it's a waste of time, of energy and resources. But I have to make a decision. From where am I going to attack this enemy? From the left side, from the right side, from the center, or from the back line with my assassins? 
So here in this deck, we have a deck with a lot of assassins, the rogue units, I mean. So this is why I'm going to focus rather by targeting the team where it hurts the most. It means the backline. And we will always try to do the same in any kind of team because there will always be a weakness somewhere in the defense and we have to use that weakness and breach from there. Don't waste your time on the most defensive and tankiest unit. Just try to find another way. So in this example, I don't want to waste my time on Titano. I want to try to achieve to kill Duelith super fast because it's dangerous. This guy deals a lot of damage. So best way to remove a problem is to attack the problem, right? So we do the same here. And then what I want to make sure is because I play around rogues, I can just ignore the Titanor and find that breach by directly attacking Duelith. Um, if I look at the mastery points that's left, I think I can sell this Lura in order to have a Ramphiet that's even more dangerous and I can kill this Duelith super fast. Then after all I need to do is to make sure that this small Lulura just stays stuck on my tank and then after this game should be a piece of cake because I'm going to attack from the weak spot and the weak spot is behind the tank here. So look at this, Duelith didn't manage to cast its Omega ability and I killed already the most dangerous unit here. Now the fight will be a piece of cake. As you can see here, I'm killing all the squishy units before taking the time to kill Titanor. If I had to waste my time on Titanor first, I might have lost the fight just because the c and the GLF would have the time to kill my team. So this is how you make a breach into the weakness into the enemy's team. Make sure to really understand and remember this concept I just shared because this will be super useful for you when you're going to compete on Illuvium. And if you really want to try to complement your knowledge and try to understand everything, you really need to check this video where I spent a lot of time explaining the four attributes that each Illuvial has and how to actually understand them to play them better. With that being said, let's become the 21st century tacticians together.